Hi there, it's Eugene and this is RIPS tutorial. Some of you have already tried to figure out how to use this tool, so thanks for your feedback, it helped me to shape this tutorial better. I'll try to cover all the important ground and keep it easy. If there's still something that is not clear, don't hesitate to ask me. RIPS is a granular synthesizer slash effects. It will be filed under effects in your DAW, so you'll need an audio track for that. The interface looks a bit crowded, and the reason being that I wanted to create a tool capable of a number of different things. But all those things share a lot in common in their designs, so I just made a single tool instead of several slightly different ones. Initially I wanted to give it the old-school hardcore look, like some awesome freeware audio tools from the past. But later I decided to make it just a bit nicer. So to me now it resembles a blackboard of some sort. You can always press the question mark button and hints will appear when you hover the mouse over the controls. Otherwise, if everything is obvious, you can turn the labels off and make it look a bit lighter. Now, some of the options may seem redundant and in some cases they are, but keep in mind that it often may depend on some characteristics of the source audio, like its dynamics, frequency content and so on. Sometimes the same processing will produce interesting results for, say, drums, and mediocre ones for voice, and vice versa. So, since it's granular, the output depends a lot on what you feed it. It has 32 voices that you can use in polyphonic or monophonic modes. Each voice has its own independent buffer. By default, RIPS uses the first stereo input, but you can have a dedicated stereo channel for each buffer. By default, a buffer starts filling as soon as the first MIDI note comes in, so if you don't play any notes via MIDI, it will just stay silent. There are three performance modes – Notes, Beat and Simple. In Simple mode, there is no granular processing, it just plays back the buffer contents. In Notes mode, the audio is cut into pieces and put together, so that you can hear a note. Now, the beat mode is fundamentally the same as the notes mode, but the length of the pieces depends on the BPM setting of your DAW and on some other parameters, which I'll discuss here later. This reel controls the length of a buffer. Its maximum size is around half million samples, which evaluates to 10 seconds at 48 kHz sample rate. Now for refilling the buffers. The buffers are being refilled asynchronously. For now, there are four options. In Notes mode, the incoming MIDI note will trigger the refill of a particular buffer whenever the corresponding voice starts playing this note. Not Glide mode. Yes, this exclamation mark means not. It basically is the same as Notes, but in monophonic mode and during portamento and legato, when you glide from one note to another, it will not refill. Played separately, Notes will trigger refilling as usual. Hold does what it says. Once the buffer is filled, it holds the contents of a buffer forever, or until you explicitly request a refill. When you switch to the tempo mode, you will see that additional meter control appears on the right. This ratio represents the amount of quarter nodes between the refill events, so all buffers will be refilled every so often. As you see, there are two more buttons related to refilling. Refill will refill all the buffers, and Refill this will refill only the picked one that is being shown in the tabs. As a side note, if a refill is called upon a currently inactive voice, the refill will be pending for this voice until the next time the voice is activated. The last control in this column is this own common switch. It's simple. When you switch to the common state, all voices read from the pick buffer without losing the contents of their own. The number next to the switch will tell you the owner of the buffer. This picked buffer, or picked tab, is important. It actually is a parameter of the plugin. This is a way to separately parameterize different buffers and voices with the same set of controls and without bloating the parameter list to LF naught. For example, here you can see two other controls, Selection Start and Selection End. They represent the selection bounds for the picked buffer. I can change the selection, then switch to another tab, and now they represent and control the selection area of this new tab. 
By the way, these two buttons are useful too. This one can make the playhead mirror against the edges of the buffer. And this one will set the playhead to the beginning of the buffer or the selection every time a new note is being played by the voice. When you hover the mouse over the tabs, you can see the contents of other buffers without picking them. To pick, you have to click the tab. If you click once more, you request that the next incoming MIDI note will be assigned to this buffer no matter what. Even if you're in the monophonic mode, it will release the previously used voice and switch to this one. It will also ignore these use buff flags here. If you click it once more, you cancel the request. If you pick another tab, the request is transferred to it. When you change select this to select all, Selection is applied to all the buffers. Clear selection button does what it says, and in conjunction with select all, it clears all the selections. The number in the middle rectangle represents the playhead position. You can aim the playhead at a certain position by left-clicking on the waveform, and it will reach that position in the time that is set by the playhead glide parameter, here on the right. In simple mode, it will sound like vinyl scratch. In notes and beat modes, it will keep the granularity, but each new grain will start further on the trajectory towards the aim. It also takes into account the repeat parameter. If the grain length with all its repeats sounds longer than the time you set by the playhead glide control, you will not notice the transition, but only find the playhead appear in the set position later. By the way, the thick transparent line represents the grain start, and the thin white the actual playhead position. Grains are fun. Depending on how you slice it all up and overlay them, the results may vary a lot. For example, if I play a note and set step parameter to zero, it will sound like a glitch. If I increase it slightly, it gets more interesting and feels alive. If I set it too high, the perception of the pitch will fall apart and it will turn into a noisy sound. I can fix it with the repeat parameter here, so the sound will still be changing, but each grain will be repeated several times. Now, this step param represents the amount of samples by which the grain start position increases each time. I could multiply it by the length of a grain, and then it will be just like the original audio. I can multiply that by the number of repeats and by the play rate too. All this gives me more control when I want to preserve the temporal and dynamical structure of the sound to some extent. Since I've mentioned play rate several times already, let's switch there for a moment. It's plain simple here. In simple mode you could use play rate to scratch the sound. In granular modes this parameter affects the speed inside the grain, not outside. There are lots of ways to make sound more alive. One of them is wobbling the playback speed. You can control the amount of wobbling and the speed. Moreover, you can wobble play rate inside the grain or use it to slightly alter the length of grains. In polyphonic mode, you can synchronize the wobble or let all the voices shake however they want in the set range and with the set speed. Another way to make things sound more interesting is to simply add some noise. Here you once again have two options, internal and external. Internal introduces error into the playhead position, and external does this for the grain start position. This nebula-like button gives you control over the way the error is introduced. When it's on, you'll add error to the correct position. When off, you will add it to the previous noisy value. So eventually your playhead will be all over the place and the large-scale temporal structure will be lost. One more way to add noise is to just skip grains. Here you have gap probability. It can be mono or stereo. You can also fill these gaps with the incoming audio. Sometimes it sounds interesting. 
One more important property of grains is the window. For those of you who don't know, it's like a hat that you put on a grain to create fade in and fade out, so that the grain sounds softer. The longer the fades are, the more neighboring grains overlap. When these fades get longer, small details are smeared. In some cases it may even sound like filtering. These fades may have different shapes. It has some effect on the character of the sound, but in general you should be fine with the parap setting here. The last thing about the grain controls is their length. With this ratio you may change the length of grains in both notes and beat modes And this matrix-like structure is useful in beat mode. It gives you control over polyrhythmic structures that you can play. For example, all Cs will play thirds, all Ds, fifths, and so on. Together with use flags, it works like a sampler. You can tell each buffer which notes it can and cannot play. Note that it allows or restricts a note in all octaves. So if I turn A off, Rips will not use this voice to play any A. However, as I mentioned, you can request this buffer anytime and ignore the flags for one next note. We've made it through the most of the controls. AGC stands for Automatic Gain Control. You will find it useful when your source is too quiet or has a huge dynamic range and you want to level it a bit. Usually just a little AGC would be enough. It can be per voice or global. There's a DC option that comes in handy with very short grains. Normally I'd restrict it to these three controls, but as you might have noticed, RIPS is not the case. There are two other params, speed and hardness. By default the speed is set to auto. It changes depending on different things internally. In manual mode there might be some noticeable amplitude modulation. Hardness lets you create a bouncy, shredded and overdriven sound. Next, the filter. All the usual stuff. On-off, cut-off, resonance, modulation by envelope, pass type. These three controls are nice. Follow node does what it says. Cut-off will be set to the frequency of the played node, or to some sensible multiple of it. It depends on the bass length ratio too, by the way. Frequency shift multiplies the cutoff in both modes. It is useful when you play low notes, but you want to preserve some of the upper frequency content as well. Play rate proportionality will multiply the cutoff by the absolute value of the play rate parameter. Note that the aimed playhead runs to its aim with a different speed. This will also affect the cutoff. Here I'd only mention these two controls, rearticulate back and forward. These are used either in monophonic mode or in portamento and legato. The function of poly mono switch is clear. The number of active voices is also obvious. Sometimes this control adds more expression to the performance. These two controls look the same as those of the envelopes, but they have a slightly different meaning. So they are used in monophonic mode or in portamento and legato, but they control whether the voice will glide from the previous frequency and continue gliding in release stage. This affects the notes that are being played separately. If your MIDI notes overlap, they glide as usual. The last feature is called Extrude. When it's on, Rips starts passing the incoming audio through. But when you send MIDI notes to it, it starts pushing the volume during the attack stage of the envelope all the way down to zero. And when you release the note, it raises the volume up again.
most of the parameters are MIDI automatable. MIDI options are available on right click. You can learn and erase MIDI control change, and in the menu of the MIDI panic control, there's an option to erase the MIDI map completely. Now, whereas some parameters are easily controlled by MIDI, others lack precision. You'll get more control over params like play rate and step with your mouse, and even more precision if you use control key modifier. For params like selection bounds and playhead position, there's additional mapping to improve precision. For selection bounds, the control change values are mapped to the visible section of the waveform. And playhead position values are mapped to the selection range. This is the hardest part. RIPS has many parameters, and as I've already mentioned, to keep the list from exploding, it uses several key parameters that others rely upon. These are Peaked Buffer, Buffer Length, and Selection Bounds. Perhaps I'll simplify it in the future, but for now please do remember to record these four params too, if you want to have results as precise as possible. When after recording you play it back, it may not be precisely what it was originally. Consider this. Maximum buffer size is 480,000 samples. So, to record the exact position in the buffer, you'll need a precision of 6 digits after the decimal point. Many hosts smooth out such small differences. I'm using Reaper, and it has adjustable smoothing, but it's still not enough to exactly reproduce some sample level stuff. However, there's a workaround for playhead aiming. There's an option in the parameter menu, drop on mouse up. When you aim and release the mouse, the automation curve will drop down. You can see these short slopes here. They will introduce additional scratching. But if your host supports multiple envelope point selection, and if there's not a billion of them, it's possible to manually adjust these slopes later. Well, that's it. If you enjoy using RIPs, spread the word, share your sounds, check out mine. Links are in the description. If you want to support what I do financially, it would be great. Links to my Patreon page and PayPal account can be found in the info panel. Thanks! See you later!